Hello, I am Jesse Weiler here for the Institute on Religious Life with Bishop Robert Vasha, who is the Bishop of the Diocese of Santa Rosa and the President of the Board for the Institute on Religious Life. Bishop, how are you doing today? I'm fine, Jesse. Thank you. Good it's to be good with you. It's good to be you. with you. I'm very excited to speak with you today, particularly, I mean, not only because you're the president of, of the board, but also because of your experience and understanding the consecrated life. And so that's what we're going to dive in here today, a lot of different aspects. But before we start with our conversation, would you mind uh, leading us in prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you promised to prepare a home in heaven for those who follow the evangelical counsels, both consecrated and those who strive to live as Christ did as a poor, humble, chaste follower of God. Surround all of us, all of our listeners, with the wall of your protection, protection against secularity, protection against COVID virus here in California, protection from fires. Grant that all who listen in and all of their families may be preserved in a mutual bond of love and fellowship. Make us generous servants to you and to our neighbor and bless all of us. And may this work of the RRL produce rich and abundant fruit for God, for the church, and for souls. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for starting us off in the, in the right direction. And I want to talk a little bit first about how you got involved with the Institute on Religious Life, and why is this, this you know, promotion of the consecrated life, why is this promotion of religious community so important to you? You know, as I reflect on the Institute of Religious Life, I was actually involved with it long before they knew that I existed. Back in 1980, and that's a few years ago, uh, Bishop Glennon Patrick Flavin of the Diocese of Lincoln was president of the IRL. And he would work with a man by the name of James Downey, Father James Downey, one of the early executive directors of the IRL. And as bishop's secretary, the bishop would say to me, if Father Downey calls, I will take the call. Bishop Flavin had a profound reverence and respect for certainly uh, Father John Hardin and for the Institute of Religious Life and served in that capacity as president for a number of years. So when I became bishop in 2000, I had some history of the IRL. And so when they contacted me about being you know, one of the many bishops who participate with the IRL, I of course was very happy to do so. And then it was in, I think 2012 or 13, that I was asked to become vice president, which I agreed to, and then shortly after uh, assumed the role of president uh, of the IRL in, in 2013. So I've been with the IRL as president for seven years. Uh, and I keep telling them that there is a term of office, but they don't seem to pay attention to me. And I'm, I'm very pleased and thrilled to be a part of IRL and to have the opportunity to serve the church by serving religious life through the IRL. And how how come you are so passionate about the consecrated life? What is it in your past or your history that has really drawn you in into that understanding? You know, there's any number of things. I, I was in a, a Catholic grade school and all of our teachers were religious sisters. When I went to Catholic high school, I think it was the first time I encountered a layman as a teacher, and there were only a couple of laymen teaching in our Catholic high school. The rest were religious and or priests. And then when I went to the seminary, it was the Vincentians, a religious order of priests who taught me. And my own sister actually joined the Daughters of Charity. And so she's been a religious sister for you know 40 years with that particular community. So I, in many ways, I, I grew up in in a a community 
in which religious life was not an adjunct or an add-on to the faith and the church, but they were part and parcel of it. They're part of the very fabric of the parish in which I grew up, of the schools to which I went, and the seminary in which I was formed. Obviously, at that point in time, religious orders were very involved with the education system in America, the uh, parish school, parochial schools, and religious life looked a lot different. It was more public and pronounced. There were more more religious, and there were more the, more of those in the consecrated life. It's not very much like that these days, although we're starting to see a renewal. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the con the contrast of what, what that religious life looked like when you were younger as to what it is looking like now. Uh, and, and it varied, I'm sure, from parts of the country to parts of the country where I grew up in, in the Diocese of Lincoln in Nebraska, uh, the religious were very prominent and, and very present and, and very supportive and supported by the, the faithful. I, I can't speak to other elements of, of the United States at that same juncture, but for me there, there was certainly a direct uh, and, and important connection. Now, the, the the connection and knowledge of religious life, as I've experienced over the past 40 years since I've been a priest, you know, has been that I, I, I'm now in a diocese where I encounter many young people who have never seen you know, a, a consecrated religious woman. You know, they will see religious priests, but really don't make a distinction between a religious priest and a diocesan priest. For them, a priest is, is a priest. Um, but the, the particular charism of the religious life is something that a lot of folks have no contact with, no experience of, no knowledge of, and therefore really sadly not a sufficient appreciation for. And I'm thrilled to be working with the IRL because as I told them two years ago, I said, you know, we, we were in a time when Father Hardin started the RRL, where he wanted to strengthen and reinforce and support religious life you know, as, as an entity. And I said, you know, our mission has to be a little bit different. We have to realize that we're talking to a Catholic audience out there, and I hope there's thousands of people out there, talking to a Catholic audience out there who maybe have some knowledge of individual religious sisters or some contact with individual religious communities, but who have precious little, if any, knowledge or understanding of consecrated religious life as it stands in itself. And by analogy, I would say people know what a priest is and because and, they see the priest saying mass. But when you ask people, well, what's the difference between a Dominican priest and a Franciscan priest? between a Franciscan priest and a Jesuit priest, between a Jesuit priest and a Benedictine priest. They may not have any kind of clarity about why those priests are different and have no knowledge of basic consecration, which is the, the, or the, uh, the, the virtues, the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, and obedience. People will say to a diocesan priest very often, well, you don't you take a vow of poverty? Well, no, you don't. You know, we're, we're, we don't take a vow of poverty. We try to live it as we should, you know, as one of the evangelical councils. But as diocesan priests, we do not take a vow of chastity the way that religious priests and certainly religious sisters do. So that, that basic consecration, taking vows in stricter imitation of Christ, of poverty, chastity, and obedience. That's the basic counsels to which they make a lifetime vow and promise to live a life according to those evangelical counsels. Now, we, we live in a very secular world, obviously, where the concept of, of poverty, some sort of detachment from material things, you know, it is not only foreign, it's, it's practically unheard of, and it's very difficult for the average layperson 
to even envision what does that look like or feel like? Because we're so much involved, at least in the Americas, you know, in this materialistic culture where what I have determines sort of who I am. And when you say you will give up everything that you have, well, then what's left? You know, a fear of sort of, I lose myself when I do that. And that's precisely the point. We entrust ourselves into the hands of Almighty God. And we say, I will trust in God. That's the vow of poverty. It is a radical living out of the call of Christ. I was reflecting on, you know, the, the call of the rich young man in, in the gospel, which I think was Monday's gospel. You know, go sell all that you have if you would be perfect. Give it to the poor and then come be my follower. Not everyone is called to that. That's an evangelical counsel. That young man was invited. As I believe today, many young people are invited. And it is an invitation. It's not a commandment. It's an invitation. Leave what you think is making, is has the power to make you happy Come and be my follower, and I promise you that you will be blessed abundantly 30, 60, and, and 100 fold. That's what consecrated religious life witnesses to. And, and, that's, and that's only poverty, chastity, you know, a challenging virtue. And in our culture, we view chastity almost as, as a negative, you know, as if it's you know, simply losing out on something else, missing something. But chastity is a positive commitment in love to another. You know, it says, I sacrifice even this worldly image of sensual pleasure for the sake of the kingdom of God, because I believe in the otherness of the kingdom of God and in the reality that if I live as Jesus calls me to live, and we're all called to live chastely, no one is, you know, is is given permission to be unchaste. Everybody is called to chastity. The difference is religious make a consecration of themselves and a promise, a vow to be chaste for the sake of the kingdom of God for the whole of their life. Right? That's chastity. And they live that beautiful virtue of purity and chastity while manifesting tremendous joy and happiness. Detachment from sensual pleasure is not uh, a sentence of misery. It is the fulfillment of a promise of, of, of happiness. And then the third element of our culture, and I was listening this week to the uh, Napa Institute set of conferences, which I would recommend people go out online and, and sign up for. But but there was this, this great presentation on, on obedience and, and as the culture says, I want autonomy more than anything else. I want to run my own life, be in charge of my own life, control my own destiny. I want the power to do what I want and when I want to do it. You know, this individual freedom element is so uh, central to our culture and people think, well, if I, if I have to do what someone else tells me to do, I will be miserable because again, my identity is caught up in this independence. My personal freedom is my pathway to happiness. Jesus says, no, I came to do the will of my father. And it is in doing the will of my father that I am fulfilled and completed. And so he says to us, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, obey me. And so consecrated religious take that counsel and they magnify it, centralize it in their lives and make a vow, a promise to be dependent materially and even in obedience on a religious superior. It doesn't mean that, that there's not consultation and that there's not dialogue and that there is not some kind of a recognition of, well, can I express my opinion here? Yes, you can, but ultimately, will you do what the council, the community, or your superior says you need to do? Yes, I will. In that act of obedience is tremendous freedom.
wonderful, enriching freedom. So poverty, chastity, and obedience are, you know, the are the core of, of religious life. And then, you know, we, we have specific manifestations of those vows in specific ways. You know, contemplative religious orders live that in in you know in, in a cloister, closed off in a more profound way from the culture living more dependently on the people of God and, and on God himself. Institute of Apostolic Life are much more active. They're much more engaged in the culture. They're much more out there doing the works of mercy in, in a physical kind of way. Contemplative perhaps focus on the spiritual works of mercy. You know, praying for conversion, praying for sinners, you know, those kinds of of things. Some religious communities exercise the vow of poverty. The Franciscans are noted for their vow of poverty in, in a more extreme way. You see these souls going around barefoot with sandals, you know, even in the wintertime. And you think there is a commitment in poverty to be a follower of Christ in a witness kind of way. In other words, they put walking to their words. And, and, it, and it strikes people in our culture in a very positive and challenging way that says we are all called to follow Christ. Maybe not to that degree or that extent, although some are, but we are all called to follow Christ as poor, humble, chaste, obedient followers of God. That's our goal. The really just witness that for us. They tell us not only is it possible, it is joyfully possible. And it is so pleasant and so wonderful that they are not afraid to invite others to join them. So that was oh, a long I, rant. So I have your turn. so many questions. I don't know that we'll get to all of them. Uh, one of my questions. You have three <laughs> yeah, minutes, I think. Yeah, we're about to sign <laughs> off. No, um, I have so many questions. One of them is. I hear this word consecrated a lot. I hear that, you know, I hear consecrated version. I, I, hear, I hear that I can consecrate myself to Mary. I hear that, you know, we're talking about the consecrated life. Are there varying degrees of consecration? Are they all, do they all mean the same thing? What does it mean to be a consecrated religious as opposed to somebody who just consecrates himself or herself to Mary? Sure. Yeah. There, there are private consecrations, and most of the things that you're talking about are private consecrations. Religious life is a consecration in a formal ecclesial ceremony where even the consecration of, of virgins, you know, there is a specific ecclesial ceremony where not only does the person consecrate themselves to God, the church receives that consecration, verifies it, ratifies it, confirms it, and it's a specific consecration made usually with a particular rule which has been approved by the church, you know, that says here is how you are to live. Un unlike, you know, husbands and wives who are consecrated to each other by the special sacrament of marriage, and there are parameters in which they are to live their lives, but what kind of car they own is up to them. You know, where they live is up to them, which parish they belong to is up to them. So a lot of those things are open, but there is a consecration there. And what's critical about all the other consecrations is that it is a sign and manifestation of the individual's desire to have their lives entrusted in many ways into the hands of God. And it's a way of saying, I will be reliant on God. Consecrated religious obviously do that to a more extreme degree because of the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So it's those vows again which constitute the core of the consecration for religious. But you know, many people, and, and I certainly encourage consecration to Mary. Right? We we really entrust ourselves to her in a fuller way. Another question that I have is that I, I'm when I see the religious life, when I see vocations, you know, priesthood, religious life, married, there, you're, like you said, there's these threads that go all throughout. I mean, we have priests and religious are they do the liturgy of the hours, but we can also bring that into the domestic church. What about those evangelical councils, the those those three vows 
can we bring into the domestic church that we can allow into our lives to help us understand that relationship better as displayed by those in religious communities? But I, I think it, it may be important, again, study of the faith is, is so critical and study of the lives of, of the saints. And it doesn't take very much study about St. Francis to find out his concept of poverty and to be enthralled by it challenged by it and you know his poverty challenges me to take a look at what i have what i own and to try to figure out what owns me yeah and sometimes we think my possessions give me freedom but they really are very often an imprisonment right and so when we bring that concept of poverty and says how can i live more freely in a more detached way, because we're all called to detachment from this world. We're all called to be attached to God and to be detached from creatures. And yet our whole culture, you know, is a culture of adverse attachments. Huh? You know, and as St. Ignatius would say, undue attachments. Yeah, you know, that, that, that confine and constrain us. Obedience, certainly we all have to struggle with that and say, you know, I have to be obedient, first of all, to the commandments by command, but I also have to strive to be a good citizen, you know, and to obey even traffic laws. You know, there is a virtue in that. And when we see religious, in effect, turning over much more than they would be required to in secular life to the authority of another. You know, that's an act of faith in God. It's an act of faith in the religious community. It's an act of profound trust in God. And so it challenges every lay person to say, how can I be more trusting of God? How can I let go of my own need to be in control of my life? which, as we know, is largely an illusion, huh? <laughs> so we're, we're not in we're control. I can't, I can't cause my heart to beat one more time. Uh, I have no power over that. It, it's, it, it could be done. Boom, you're gone. Yeah. So where's the autonomy? Where's the power? It's all in God's hands. And the sooner we recognize that, the more joyfully we entrust ourselves to that, the richer we will be in, in this world and certainly in the world. I want to go back to obedience because that seems to be something that you're, you're really focusing on a lot. And especially times right now where we have all this unrest, not just met, you know, medical and health unrest, but un unrest in our country of people really unsatisfied with the way things are going. And this this idea of obedience can sometimes really get away from us. And And as you know, there's this theory, this pendulum theory where we can go just in our personal lives, but also as a culture from one extreme to the other. And I was actually trying to join a, a Franciscan uh, community, you know, five, six, seven years ago. And my thought about joining this community was that I, I thought if I joined this community, uh, I, I could I could really live that path to sainthood because all I had to do was obey the superior. And even if I didn't like it, all I had to do was just say yes daily and I would be totally good and I would be totally fine. And so I think that is an that is an opposite reaction that almost leads to apathy where it's like, well, I'm not really going to contribute or take responsibility or be proactive. I'm just going to be reactive and put all of that onus on somebody else. I'm wondering if you uh, see any of that as part of our culture or that thread where you see people in religious communities as well thinking the same thing. You know, I, I don't know that I would see that I have ever seen someone who has that complete abdication of self into the superior, sort of the person, you know, who's climbing a, a mountain and says, lower the rope, and they tie it around themselves, and they pull me up. You know, that's not how it works. You know, there, there is a, a mutual cooperation. And what you would have realized if you had stayed in, in religious life is that that degree of obedience is extremely difficult yeah because we have our own will we have our own want we have our own desire and putting to death our own desire is not as easy as simply saying well i'm just going to let them do it for me 
because human nature being what it is, we, you know, contend with that. And so there is in our culture this tremendous demand uh, to you know, fulfill the, you know, the, the 40s song, I did it my way, you know. And, and so this sense of my way, and I have to agree with it in order, you know, for it to be to be worthwhile. Wait, no, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. We are members of a community and a society, and that's where obedience comes in, in, in a religious community, where there is this recognition that my individual desire, want, or even my individual good can and perhaps must be sacrificed sometimes in order for the good of the community as a whole. You know, and if I am not willing to sacrifice myself, my own will, my own want, my own desire, my own way, in order to accommodate the other members of this community who, in the ideal order, are likewise willing to do the same for us, then I'm going to have a very difficult time of it, right? Because the community does not exist solely for my benefit. It does exist for my benefit, but it exists for the benefit of the whole church and a recognition that if we can cooperate with one another in this you know, wonderful Christ-like setting, then we can do tremendous good. But the moment any individual begins to focus on themselves, and say, well, what about me? And what about my feelings? And what, you know, the moment that self focus becomes the center, you, you have room for all kinds of discord. And I see that in our society. Every individual out there is focused on themselves. What is good for me? And there's a bit of a lost capacity to say, is this good for the person? You know? How is this good for society as a whole? We have to be able to ask that question. We have to be able to recognize that that's a legitimate question. And we have to have the self-discipline and the self-sacrifice that makes it makes us capable of acting on what we see. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much. And, and I think that's very true. And I think as long as you, your intentions are pure and holy and you're understanding that that humility, I think that's that's the way to go. But it, I, as you said, that selfishness creeps in with all of us, and and we try to to figure things out as sometimes I, as a puzzle. If I can do this, then this happens, and it's not always that way. Uh, I I want to talk briefly about the Marian Sisters of Santa Rosa, the the sisters that you this mm -hmm. order that you invited into your home to your diocese. Uh, I would love to hear about this because not only do you have this profound love for consecrated religious and are the president of the board for the Institute on Religious Life and, you know, all, all of that. But you you put action into those words and, and actually invited this religious order into your diocese. I would love to hear your thought behind bringing them in, what types of benefits you, you've seen in having this robust community in your diocese and where where you where you hope to see it go. Certainly, I consider the Marian Sisters of the Diocese of Santa Rosa a singular blessing for me and, and for the diocese. And I, I must admit, and I say this very honestly, uh, I did precious little to bring them here. I just happened to be here when they came. And I'm grateful that I have been the recipient uh, of them. I did welcome them, and I guess from that standpoint, I, I had some active part, but it was mostly God's work. Uh, they came, I think, in 2012, and were, as we oftentimes see now in in communities that are undergoing some sort of transformation, that there will be a need to split, you know, or you have different concepts, and so two communities will form. In some ways, that's what happened here. And these two sisters came to me and said, we have a vision for religious life and we'd like to pursue it. And I said, sure, why, why not? It sounds appealing and attractive to me. They were absolutely devoted to 
the teachings of, of the Holy Father about consecrated religious life. They had, you know, a firm founding and, and rooting, you know, in the fundamentals of, of consecrated religious life. And so I, I saw them as a, a suitable uh, foundation you know, for religious community in, in Santa Rosa. We have had a number of religious communities over the years who serve and continue to serve the church extremely well. There is something, however, about a, a, a younger, more vibrant uh, religious community coming into a parish and particularly into, into a school, you know, that catches the imagination of the young and the old as well. Some through some form of nostalgia, but others because of a recognition that this is a beautiful manifestation of the life that Christ calls us to live. And, and we need that witness. I, I, a phrase I've used o over the years is, you know, people will often say, well, wouldn't it be nice if we had some religious sisters teaching in our school? And I just want to grab people by the throat, shake them and say, no, it would not be nice. You know, it's not nice. It's necessary. You know, it's essential. You know, but th th they're not frosting on the cake. You know, they're the very core, in many ways, the heart, you know, uh, and spirit of the church manifest in our parishes, in our diocese, and in our schools. And without that heart, we can do a lot of good things. But that central vibrancy, you know, that depth of commitment, that spark, you know, that complete dedication to Christ, if it's absent, yeah, how is it going to become present, you know, in the lives of the students? When they see certainly commitment on the part of lay people, right? but not that sense of total consecration to God. They don't see the living out of the evangelical councils, poverty, chastity, and obedience in that you know, greatly magnified way. And I tell you, we are attracted to the more difficult. Yeah? There's a little hill outside of Santa Rosa. No one says, oh, I climbed such and such a hill. Yeah? But if they climb Mount Everest, you know, they would be boasting on it. There'd be posters and bumper stickers in the whole nine yards. So the more challenging, the more difficult. Religious life is not a flat, even path. It's a steep climb. It's a difficult climb. It's a challenging climb. And we have to hold out to our young people that there are people making that climb. You can make that climb too. You know, God invites you, draws you. If you have the will, the desire to love, you can follow Christ as a priest or religious sister. You can follow Christ, you know, in great chastity, even as a high school student and a college student. You can follow Christ by de being detached from material things. And the religious witness that for you, encourage you, and fortunately with the contemplative orders, they pray for us constantly as a tremendous sign and source of spiritual enrichment and strength for us. Well, that is well put. And, and thank you for your commitment, because I think, you know, as as like I like I said before, you know, we had all these religious in the education system before, and that's not always the case now. And so hopefully we can start to reintroduce those concepts and that that my children can see religious regularly to see that as a possible yeah. vocation, because if they don't see it, they don't know it exists, then it's not an option for them if they don't know about it. So and that's and, and, and just as, as a plug for right, the IRL, right. I mean, I've got to do this as president. Mm -hmm. You know, if if any of you listeners value religious life, then support the IRL because the IRL is doing a major contributory work of enriching, strengthening, fostering and informing people about the value, the need, the necessity the absolute necessity of consecrated religious life. So go to their website, IRL.com, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or IRL.org. I forget which one it is. But um, it, and, and they need they need the support and encouragement because they do wonderful, wonderful work. And in our secularized age, we very much need the presence and witness of religious life. Without it, you know, we're gonna just limp along 
with religious life, we can make great progress. That, well, you took the words right out of my mouth. And the, the website is religiouslife.com. You can find out about all these religious orders that are affiliates of our program. And there's a lot out there. So, so definitely go check it out. Bishop, thank you so much for your time. I uh, really uh, fondly enjoyed this time together. And before we close, would you mind giving myself and all the viewers today a blessing? Sure. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you kindly and give you his peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless all of you. Thank you. Good to be with Amen. you. Amen. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope to have you back on the show again in the near future. God bless Thank you.